All right. Welcome back for another episode of Talking Ball with Pat Leonard. We have another very special guest coming off NFL Draft Weekend. Going to get right into that. First, want to tell you about Bet Online. BetOnline.ag is your number one source for all your basketball info, stats, news, and scores. Get the latest odds and lines, including the latest player reports for this year's pro basketball playoffs. BetOnline is always your sports information headquarters this season. We have you covered for all your sports wagering needs, basketball, MLB, NHL hockey, right to UFC and boxing. BetOnline is the fastest and easiest way to get your betting info, including live betting options and your favorite casino and card games you can play right from your home. Head to the website today or use your mobile device to get in on the action. Be sure to use our promo code BELIEVE, that's B-L-E-A-V, to receive your 50% welcome bonus on your first deposit. Bet online, where the game starts. And where we start is with our special guest, as I said, Jeremiah Searles, an agent and owner at One West Sports Group, a six-year NFL offensive lineman, Chargers, Vikings, Panthers, Bills, and in New York, you should know him now as a representative of second round Giants pick John Michael Schmitz, the center out of Minnesota. Jeremiah, thank you so much for joining me here on Talking Ball. No, I, I appreciate the invite, man. Always good to talk ball. Um, you know, we're a football first agency. So anytime you get a chance to talk football, I'm always about it. So what was draft weekend like for you, for the agency, for for you, for for John Michael? I mean, I know I came out of it feeling like I had done a month's worth of work in three days. I can't imagine what it feels like from the agency side and the player side and the family side of how much preparation you guys put into it. Yeah, I mean, from really from since January, you know, it's essentially my Super Bowl now. You know, I was like kind of say like I had football season when I played, but then pre-draft season is now my season, right? You prepare all through the fall and recruiting guys and getting guys signed. And then once you have your class in January, it's all about starting to prepare them for all the steps in the process from their all-star game to combine prep to the combine to pro day prep to 30 visits to Zoom meetings. You know, you're prepping your players all while still gathering info from teams and seeing where they fall on their boards and how they might fit and trying to just do all those things. Then it just comes to a big head on draft weekend. And, you know, it's a really fun time, but it's a stressful time as well. No doubt. Though I will say, you know, you helped me put together, connect the dots. You're always trying to figure out what players and teams are going to be great matches. And I think that from the beginning, Jeremiah playing for Brian Dable and Bobby Johnson and the Bills, your relationship with them, your knowledge of their offense, your connection to John Michael Schmitz, the fact that the Giants had a center need and also viewed him as one of the top players on their board. I think from the beginning, it became clear that this could be a good match. You guys have to be ecstatic about the fact that this match actually happened, I would think. Oh, absolutely. You know, all the way from when Bobby came in and visited John Michael right before um, his pro day, um, you know, and I got a chance to reconnect with Bobby and we've stayed in touch throughout the years and just being able to chance to see how he could fit and really just kind of talk with Bobby and just see like, hey, this is a need that you guys have with Feliciano moving on to San Fran. Like everyone's looking for that 10 year center. Everyone's looking for that guy that's going to come in and plug and play, right? I mean, and you see it with Linderbaum last year. You saw it with Creed Humphrey the year before. These young centers having tremendous success. And also, when you can get a guy that you can believe can start for a long time on you, it really takes a lot of that pressure off that big quarterback deal that they just signed with Daniel Jones because yeah. everything is going to start pointing back to the salary cap at one point or another here. Yeah, so it's so funny. We talked in the pre-draft process. I did a story you can read on nydailynews.com, but I'm watching game one of the NBA Eastern Conference uh, semifinals between the Sixers and the Celtics. James Harden had 45 points and the, and the Sixers upset the Celtics on the road in game one. But all I can think of hearing James Harden's name, because I'm a, I'm a true football guy now, because you have me hearing the James Harden, James Harden play call <laughs> from Brian Dable's offense ringing in my ears. And I bring mm -hmm. that up because I wanted to ask you, one of the main things that um, I think – John Michael and the Giants really identified with, along with his physical abilities, were his mental capabilities, his ability to work in a complex offense like this. Can you explain why the words James Harden to the, to the listener out there, whether it's a Giants fan or an NFL out, fan out there, why those two words can exemplify why John Michael can handle the complicated offense Brian Dable runs? 
Absolutely. You know, and so when I say James Harden, when you hear James Harden, I use that because it's ingrained in my brain too. Um, when I joined the Buffalo Bills week three of the 2018 season, I had come off IR with Carolina and I joined and they were like, Hey, here's our base offense. I was like, Oh, cool. I'm learning the playbook and they go, and here's all the code words that mean everything for that offense. And it was almost longer than the playbook. <laughs> and they were like, Dable likes to use these because he likes to keep things simple and he likes to move fast. And you got to see the growth of that offense through 2018 with Josh Allen as a rookie to what it was in 2019 and then so on and so forth. You've just seen it kind of develop. And, you know, the biggest piece of that is being able to retain from the meeting room into the practice field into the game. Right. And all of those things come into a big togetherness. So, for example, I'll use James Harden. Right. James Harden, the word means a formation. It means a play and it means a route concept. All of that, right? And it all is dependent on what hash you're on, too. So you have to understand, okay, if I'm on the right hash and I hear James Harden, then I know that it's in a left formation. I know that we're in empty protection. And I know that uh, it's this route concept, right? All that is happening very quickly because Dable wants to get the ball snapped. You know, mm -hmm. so having a center that can understand, digest, and then regurgitate because you might be playing next to a guy that's not the starter. You might be playing next to a guy who, like myself, had just gotten there. And you hear, hey, James Harden, you run up into the ball. You're looking at the center for going, hey, what's the play? And he's got to be able to look at you and go, hey, it's 74 or empty protection or whatever it is, and we're going to the will. Here's the call. And it happens very quickly. And so I think the, all that coming in, that's just one play, and there's hundreds of those. And I do mean hundreds of those. So, I mean, John Michael's got a steep learning curve in front of him, but I think they identified that he's an extremely smart player and has a ton of experience playing football. You know, he has a ton of just playing experience with six years at Minnesota. Hmm. when you played so you make me think of too so you get handed that kind of playbook and mm -hmm. all those code words what is the best way as as an o-lineman or as a as a center as you served as with playing with the first team during that one off season with the bills mm -hmm. when dable and johnson were both there what's the best way to learn that like do you sit in a room read it over and over again make calls into the mirror or is the only way to really learn it to be out there in a field with a bunch of guys and just keep repeating it that way? Yeah, you know, and I'm actually having this conversation with John Michael um, as we're going here that before he gets rookie minicamp. You know, I always tell guys, learn the concept first. So learn the concept. Before you try and learn the code word, you need to understand the concept. Like you need to understand what protection and what the scheme is. Is it a mic point? Is it a will point? You know, what linebacker are we going to? Which direction are we sliding? You have to understand the concept of the play before you can put the code word with it. So mm -hmm. and you want to learn all that first, but then with the way I did it, flashcards, 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 right? I had my wife quiz me all the time. You know, oh. I'd, she'd have, I'd have a stack of index cards that was inch and a half, two inches thick, and she'd flip over and it would say James Harden. And I had to regurgitate it back to her as fast as I could. And then she'd put the, <laughs> she'd put the pile I got right in one. And then the one I got wrong, she wouldn't tell me it was wrong. She just put it in the other pile. And then she'd move right to the next one because we have to stay going and then she'd start over with the pile that I missed you know and so that for me was the quickest way to learn but you know everyone's different some guys can hear it and just have it right away um, you know some guys need the reps and the walkthrough and the ability to it but you know that's one thing I love about coach Johnson and Bobby is he knows that everyone learns differently and mm -hmm. he's not a square peg round hole type of coach you know he's hey everyone learns differently in order for everyone to have the most success in order for me to keep my job these guys have to prepare and these guys have to perform you know, and so I really respected that about Bobby of how he taught and the way he taught. And he's not afraid. Of, hey, come to, come to my office. Let's walk through this a little bit more or all those things. You know, and that's what I think makes Bobby his rise from assistant to head offensive line coach to the success that the New York Giants had last year is come a long way because of the way that Bobby coaches. And so why do you think um, the pro day dinner that Bobby had? So, you know, Bobby that well. Yep. And you also know John Michael. What what effect do you think that pro day dinner and that pro day workout had, knowing how Bobby coaches, how he evaluates players, and then knowing how John Michael comes off when he meets teams and coaches in that way? Yeah, you know, I think the biggest thing that went through that is we had prepared John Michael as an agency um, and in our gym that we have him working at with NFL concepts. You know, that's one thing that we do is we want to make sure we're trying to teach these guys the route concepts and understand the protection concepts, not giving them names and words because that was confusing, but just understanding the big picture. Okay. Right. And we'd been doing that with John Michael for about two and a half months then. And so when Bobby pulled up his um, protection sheets and, and quizzed him, like 
I, like I said, he understood the concept already. So then he was just understanding the terminology that Bobby wanted to use. And so I think for Bobby, that was like, okay, this guy has a grasp already on what's going on. And he was able to take in the information, eat dinner, regurgitate the information back to me. So he has very good recall. Right. And those are the things you only get. I mean, I think all in all, the Giants probably got to spend close to an hour, an hour and a half with John Michael in total between pro days and senior bowl and combine and all those things. Like you only get two hours max to really evaluate these kids on a face to face basis. Why it's so important that when you have those opportunities, we tell our guys all the time, you got to knock them out of the park. You know, and I think John Michael was prepared. And then because of the work that he had put in on the field and then the work he had put in studying those concepts and stuff, he was able to knock the whole process out of the park, which helped him raise to a second round pick. You hit on the idea that you guys were working with him pre-draft. I'm fascinated by, so for listeners who do not know, Jeremiah and Alex Boone have opened and are operating an offensive line only gym in Minneapolis, I believe that's yes. correct, called Brute. And could you walk me through what Brute entails? And maybe the pre-draft process is a perfect example of how you guys operate and the services you provide. But I do think this is really interesting stuff, especially when you talk about how little time these teams can spend with these players, but in the behind the scenes with nobody seeing, there's a lot of work going on to prepare these guys, not just for their interviews, but for the actual NFL football, right? Yeah, absolutely. So about two years ago, um, Alex and I kind of, again, we played together in Minnesota. He's been one of my best friends. He and him and I were talking like, there's not enough places that are preparing offensive linemen for the NFL in the pre-draft process. You know, there's the Charles Bentley where, Alex Boone is actually was client number one of LaCharles, so he comes from that tree. And then there's Duke Mannyweather, who also comes from the LaCharles tree. You know, and so really there was only those two places. You know, there's 55 O-linemen every year that get drafted and another 50 to 60 that go on to his free agents. And, you know, everyone wants to, oh, he ran really fast. He jumped really high. But it's like, yeah, but can he move a guy from point A to point B against his will on a consistent basis? Can he set and not get bull rush by Dexter Lawrence over and over and over again. Like those are the things that we were like, okay, let's focus on that. You know, the combine training. Yes, we will focus on the 40. We will focus on pro agility and all those things. But how are we helping these guys so that when they get into an NFL offensive line room, they're ready to contribute right away. And all that Mm. comes from fixing their sets, fixing their hands from a very professional side that Alex and I put together a education side of on the field and off the field of just, our experiences, right? At 10 years in the league, six years in the league, I had four different O-line coaches. Alex had six. And just taking things that we wow. knew and we learned and saying, okay, we're going to give this to you so that you're two months ahead or four months ahead when you show up to rookie minicamp next week. And all those things just work together. And so we've been preparing guys like that for the last two years. Cordell Volson was a great example two years ago. Fourth round pick to the Cincinnati Bengals. Ended up starting every game for them at left guard as a rookie. You know, And so we're hoping John Michael can follow in those footsteps of, hey, second round pick would love for him to be a day one starter and just be prepared and just be able to go help his team contribute and win games. Can you give me an example of when you're educating these players on the concepts you referred to, like mm-hmm. the football concepts that you want them to learn and be able to apply quickly? Can you just give me an, uh, or the average football fan an example of, you know, you let's say you have a certain play concept mm-hmm. on the screen and you're trying to show a group of 10 guys something. What are the kind of things that you're trying to instill in them as far as, okay, Here's something in the NFL you're going to see a lot, maybe that you didn't see in college, and then ha- and then how are you teaching that? Are you taking them yeah. out to the field? Or are you having them regurgitate it back? How does that go? Yeah, you know the biggest one and the easiest one is protections. You know, in college, protections are extremely simple, right? Usually, you look over to the sideline and there's a big guy holding a poster board of a rubber duck, and you're like, oh, I know this play. <laughs> um, you know, but in the NFL, I tell guys you're going to walk into a game with probably six to eight different protection concepts. One's a Mike based, one's a Will based. One's a Sam base, like all those things. So the first thing we do is say, okay, you lived in this little world that you know is the box, right? Your down lineman, your linebacker. We're going to expand it now. You're looking at safeties, corners, all those things. So we start there. And then the number one thing we start installing is it's called a sort principle protection. And we're going to get really football here. So hang with me. Let's do it. So we'll have you have your four down linemen and a mic point, right? We'll start with a mic point protection, right? So if it's a three by one, if it's two by two, say it's a three by one to your right. You have to then understand how to identify the mic linebacker, the middle of three, right? So the first thing we do is, hey, this is how you identify the mic. You start your, you start weak, right? There's your will. There's my mic. There's my Sam or my nickel, right? And then you bring it back in and go, okay, there's our mic declaration. 
but now we're going to put a sort principle on it. So now you have to say, okay, there's my first guy, but if that guy drops, we then push out to the second guy. And that blows guys' minds. They're like, wait, what do you mean? I was like, you have to protect four to a side. You have to be able to protect that, and then you have to be in tune with being able to bump as a center. If your mic drops, it's your job to get that right tackle out to that edge pressure, right? And so we just start looking at all the different things. And so what I do is I pull up tape. I have NFL tape. I pull up tape on and say, okay, hey, walk me through. If this is our mic-based protection, what's the call and how do we pick this up? And then we do that and we run through it on tape. And then Alex will take them out on the field and put them through a drill with real bullets now. And it's like, okay. And we just do that. And we just drill it over and over and over again before you start realizing like it's not your eyes that take you there. Your body takes you there and then you react. Wow. And so that's just kind of a mini protection concept. And we do that with every protection scheme that we have um, from empty to six man to, five, to seven man, all those things, just to try and get them to understand. And then once they get to their team, just plug and play the terminology and you're good to go. That's fascinating, man. That that's football school is what yeah, that is. That's exactly what we try to create. And so for example, now John Michael gets drafted by the Giants. Are you guys able to, or I guess he's a part of the Giants now, but can you say to him, to, you know, today, call him up and say, Hey, here's what Dan Quinn likes to run in Dallas. Um, you know, that concept we talked about in February, take a look at this film for the Cowboys and apply it. Like, can you do that kind of stuff now with guys still? Yeah, we still can. Um, you know what, what I did last year with Cordell is I would do some advanced scouting for him. Um, you know, we'd say, Hey, here's, you're playing Cam Hayward week one. Here's what I could break down of, Hey, here's his pass rush moves. Here's what I've seen. But I try and stay out of the weeds as far as what you're going to see from your protection from your coach. Cause there's going to be little nuances and little rules. So I try and just be a sounding board of it's like, Hey, I'm struggling to get this concept. All right. Hey, take a picture of it. Send it to me. Let's walk through it. Right. Like those type of things are where I try and I try and stay out of Bobby's way now because he's in the NFL and it's like, hey, never <laughs> stepping on toes. Yeah. But I'm always there as a sounding board of, hey, I've been there. I've sat in those. Hey, this is a funky look. Let's talk through how you would want to pick that up and what you what are you seeing? And just trying to be a mentor as we go through with these guys, too. No, this is great stuff. Forget John Michael. I'm learning right now. <laughs> this is um this sounds like I know you have a podcast, the O line committee, I believe yes, that you and Alex are doing. Is this the kind of stuff you're gonna you're gonna do both on YouTube and on your podcast? Is like real get into the real football breakdowns of it all? Yeah, we want to bring a podcast. So Phil Mackey, Alex Boone, myself, um, started the O line committee. Uh, we got put in YouTube jail for whatever reason, but we're back now. Um, but yeah, we wanna we wanna explain to people's view of the offensive lines view of a game we want to show hey this is what we're looking at this is what we see this is how we identify things because you never get to hear the calls that are going on up front you never get to see the way the guard and the right tackle are working together or how a center saves a sack because you see him coming back and picking up an extra guy and so we're going to dive into all that again it's a lot of the education because it's really easy to blame the o-line when bad things go bad (laughs) <laughs> but sometimes it's not our fault. And a lot of times it's not like we're just doing what we're told, um, you know, but that's really what the O line committee is about is just going through having fun, talking ball, sharing stories. I just shared a story of when uh, Julius Peppers threw me on my head, you know, so all those fun things that we'll get to dive into. And it's just going to be a really fun project that Alex and I have started. Not only do the O linemen get blamed when it's not their fault, but they're also you're also humble guys. So it's not like you're going to stand up and say it wasn't me. It was him. Correct. <laughs> so it ends up being uh, judged out from the outside looking in. So. Go follow, if you're not already, Brute O-Line on Instagram. That's the offensive line only, Jim. And then O-Line Committee on YouTube. That's where you can find the content. It's going to keep coming. Podcasts, wherever you get your podcast, download, et cetera. A lot of breakdowns coming. So, Jim, Jeremiah, back to Bobby Johnson. Mm-hmm. You had mentioned something to me when we talked pre-draft. I thought it was very interesting. You know, John Michael, I met him after the Giants drafted him. Extremely impressive kid. Obviously, you mentioned, you know, six years at Minnesota. He's been the leader there forever. But you told me that Bobby Johnson, he wants his center, he wants his linemen, the players to police the room. And that has to be difficult as a young player. I don't care if you're in the safety room, quarterback room, offensive line room. If you're a rookie and now the coach is saying to you, this is your room, you run it. First of all, How difficult is that for a young guy? Secondly, how do you envision John Michael can take that head on and be that guy in year one for the Giants with Bobby as his coach? Yeah, you know, the number one thing is you you have to walk into that room humble but confident. You have to walk into the O-line room with a humility of, I know I am a rookie. I know I have a lot way to go, but I am the right guy for the job. 
And you have to earn that trust and earn that respect from the guys in that room. And, you know, the way you do that is by going about your business every single day as a true pro. You go about it by making sure that there's not a lot of mental mistakes. There's going to be some because you are a rookie and that's just life. But how you correct those mistakes, how you take the coaching, and then also just how you carry yourself. You know, all those things, everyone understands the center is the quarterback of the line. It doesn't matter if you earn that starting spot and he has to earn it. He has to go in and earn the starting spot as a center. He's not just going to get it handed to him. No one gets it handed to you in the NFL. It's just not how it works. Yeah. If he earns that starting spot, it's because he did all those things I mentioned. He's going to have the respect of his peers. And that's the number one thing that you can ask for as an NFL player is having the respect of your teammates that they're going to be there for you, but also know that as a center, you have to make the hard conversation sometime. You have to get on the guy that's next to you who may be a five, seven year, 10 year NFL vet. And if he screws up, it's your job to let him know. And that's just because that comes with the territory. And it's not an easy thing to do. It's a very hard thing to do. You know, but one thing I think that's really important that I mentioned about John Michael is you know, a lot of guys said, you know, why are you coming back for a sixth year? You know, because he had a great draft grade coming out as a fifth year. But if you look back at what that fifth year was on that Minnesota offensive line, he had Sam Schluter, who played in the NFL, Blaze Andrews, who played in the NFL, Daniel Falahi, he played in the NFL, and then Connor Olsen could have played in the NFL. He was kind of not the guy in that room because they were all seniors, mm -hmm. you know, versus you look at it and he still was the standout. Now you put him in the next year, he's a sixth year guy. He's got four new guys around him and they didn't miss a beat. And a lot of that is because of how John Michael led that room. And I think that was really good for him to show that he can lead a group of older guys and he can also lead a group of younger guys. And I think that really helped him in his leadership ability and it helped guys evaluate who he could be as a leader in those O-line rooms. He told us that he believes he is a nasty player when required, but when you meet him, it's hard to envision him being nasty to anybody. He comes off as a polite Midwest kid. Is he just one of those guys that, you know, once he gets in between the lines, once he gets in the ring, he just kind of flips a switch? Absolutely. You know, every, everyone has to have that little bit uh, crazy in them to play O-line in the NFL, and he has it. <laughs> you know, you got to see it. You know, people are down at the Senior Bowl, got to see it firsthand of like, oh, wow, okay, this kid's out here throwing dudes around. And, I mean, he told me, and he's like, I'm not here to make friends. He goes, I'll make friends on my team. I'm not here to make friends at the Senior Bowl. And he was right. Like, you're not there to, oh, how let's have fun. Like, you're trying to go get drafted and earn a spot. And that's just his mentality. He's like, yeah, and now that I'm on my team, we're here to make friends, but enemy colors are enemies. No doubt. I even heard a story that down at the Senior Bowl, I don't know if one of the guys was goofing off or got in trouble or what it was, but that at some point, John Michael kind of put, grabbed everybody together and said, like, we're, we got to take this week seriously. You know, it, it's on all of us. My performance affects yours. Your performance affects mine. And when I heard something like that, I thought, you know, going back to the idea of how do you run a room, that made me think like, yeah, he's going to be a rookie, but he gets it. Mm -hmm. Like that, that comes off as somebody who gets what it takes. Um, and I know that, you know, for the, from the giants end, certainly, um, they figured that out, you know, that it didn't take them long to figure that out. Um, so another question when the center, and this is based on your playing in the league as well, yeah. when you play offensive line, you're talking all about how much the center runs the O line, the center's making the calls. Do you ever have situations where the center points out the mic and, you know, starts making the calls and like the left tackle thinks he sees something different and corrects him and says, you know, like, let's say you're at the line of scrimmage and says, no, 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 it's this. And like, can you, does that kind of conversation happen right at the line of scrimmage? Or is it kind of like, no, you're our leader. Whatever you say is what we do. That's it. Yeah. You know, we had a saying, uh, one wrong, all wrong. And, you know, mm -hmm. what it goes there is you can't have – no one can override the center besides the quarterback. So as a tackle, and I played tackle in the league, I would always alert center back, hey, I think we see something out here, right? But ultimately it was his responsibility to change the call if we were going to or the quarterbacks because if I go rogue and we're 10 seconds into the play clock to get snapped <laughs> and I'm like, hey, fan, 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 and he's talking to the left guard and I'm the right tackle, well, the communication's not going to get there. Like we have to all trust in the center's ability and say, hey, even if we're wrong, we'll all be wrong together, which gives us a chance, right? Like even if we're all sliding and say we did miss this blitz, well, let's hope the back can make us right, right? Like those are the kind of things that as a young player, you got to make sure that you're willing to take, hey, I'll listen to everyone. Hey, okay, what are you seeing? What are we thinking? But at the end of the day, my call stands. My call is truth. 
And that's what it has to be because if you don't, then that's when you see the free runners. That's when you see guys that the quarterback thinks he's safe on that side because that was the initial play call and someone went rogue. Like that's the kind of stuff that turns into strip sacks and bad, bad news. Fasc- fascinating, fascinating look inside the game. All right. So Jeremiah, I want to also ask you, this is about John Michael, a question that he, I think he was probably being humble, but he was asked towards the end of his press conference, like, Hey, what tape are you most proud? Were you most proud of in college? What game do you think you played the best? When did you stand out the most? And he said, you know, nothing stands out, <laughs> but I put it to you, somebody who obviously thinks very highly of his game and knows his game inside and out. Is there a, a, a play or a series or a game of his at Minnesota that you would, you would tell somebody who's never seen him play before, say, flick this on and watch it. This is who John Michael Schmitz is. Yes, this year against Iowa. They didn't end up winning the football game, but he had more what I call key blocks when I grade the film out in that game than any other game this year. You know, one of the great ones is there's a long play, Mo Ibram. It's a wide zone to the left, and John Michael reaches this nose guard like he's standing still and just rides him out there, and there's this <laughs> hole that's, I mean, enormous, and you just see Mo Ibram cut right off John Michael, and it's a 60-yard gain. If Mo was faster, he would have scored. Um, but, you know, that's... <laughs> Just the truth. He got ball hawked a lot this year. He got caught. Yeah. And he got caught a lot. But, you know, his Iowa game was as close to flawless of a game that I watched him play this year. And, you know, that's when I really felt like he was really put it all together. You know, he had some dominant games early, he had some less dominant games. But that Iowa game, it all clicked. And his run blocking was outstanding. His pass block was outstanding. If you're looking for a game to go say, who is John Michael Schmitz, Minnesota versus Iowa this year. Giants fans, NFL fans, go check out that tape. All right, so now getting back to maybe putting your O-line committee hat on, Mm -hmm. because you know O-line so well and you know this draft class so well, I wanted to get into the first round offensive line fits and see what you think of some of these picks. Because obviously in in any of these couple top two rounds, when a team takes a player like the Giants with Schmitz in the second round or some of these teams taking tackles in the first, they're intending for them to make major impacts they don't always do that. So I uh, wanted to ask you about starting off with Paris Johnson going to Arizona. He ends up being the first one off the board, uh, the tackle from Ohio State. What do you think of a, him as a fit there, and what do you think of him as a prospect and a player? Yeah, you know, I think they they had to address the need of protecting Kyler Murray. Um, you know, looking at their roster, though, you're kind of thinking, okay, where is he going to play, right? You have DJ Humphreys, who's making a lot of money to play your left tackle. And then you have Kelvin Beecham, who's over there on the right side, you know. So I'm curious what they're going to do. There's going to be some shuffling there. I bet you there's even a couple of vets that might get released, you mm-hmm. know, but I could see him coming in and them saying, hey, you're going to start at right tackle for us this year. Once Humphreys' deal is over, we'll move you over to left. Or they might say, Humphreys, maybe you want to move over to right, but he's going to be a starting tackle for them. I think he's a really good fit. He was the number one tackle in my board um, coming into the draft this year, just his athletic ability, the fact that he's extremely young. You know, so you're going to get a lot of play time out of him and a second contract out of him if you like him. You know, I think that's a good fit in a division that you're going against the San Francisco 49ers and Aaron Donald (laughs) and those crazies twice a year. So you have to address that need. I think it's a great fit for Arizona. There were some uh, draft Knicks saying that Johnson ideally would be able to put a little bit more weight on that. Maybe his strength needed work. I mean, is that just something you chalk up to? He's young. Like that shouldn't be a knock against the guy because obviously he ends up being the first guy off the board. Yeah, no, you can't. You can't say a guy needs to get stronger when you watch his college tape and watch what he did. You know, you can always get stronger. I, you always want to get bigger, faster, stronger. That's the name of being a professional athlete. But you can't teach his size and his athleticism um, to be able to protect off the edge. All right, so next one was Darnell Wright uh, from Tennessee going to the Chicago Bears. What do you think of that one? This one surprised me a little bit. Um, you know, I thought that he had a fantastic senior bowl week. You know, I think the senior bowl week is actually what really faulted him up boards. You saw him absolutely. He had the heaviest hands at the senior bowl, and it wasn't even close. Like when he struck guys, you saw head snaps, and you heard mm. the collective ooh and ahs as the scouts in the back were watching. Um, you know, I thought that he's going to be a starting right tackle in the NFL. I don't think he's necessarily a good fit at left, you know, but I think he's going to be a starting right tackle. I think he's also a guy that could have some guard flexibility as a young player. If you need to get him to kind of get his feet wet and you don't want to just throw him out there on the edge right away because he is a mammoth of a human and an extremely powerful individual. (laughs) Yeah. It also, people seemed really enamored too um, with his tape, I believe against Will Anderson 
um, where he, you know, really kind of opened some eyes, but that's, that's an interesting point you just make about the senior bowl. And to, to be honest, this was my first senior bowl, Jeremiah. Mm-hmm. And I, I'm a guy though, who I like seeing it with my own eyes. For sure. I mean, I value analytics. I value stats. I value any kind of information I can get my hands on, but you know, look at, for example, Julius Brents, the corner from Kansas state, you see a guy with that kind of length just blanketing receivers. Even when he's out of coverage, he's still in coverage. And you go to offensive linemen, like you said, it just sounds and looks different if a guy is making different kind of contact. I just feel like you really can't replicate that kind of uh, eyes on the player type type scouting. Absolutely. It's why I think Senior Bowl, Shrine Bowl, PA games, those games are so important in the pre-draft process. I mean, if you're a top 15 pick and you know you are, then yeah, you don't have to go to those. But I mean, a lot of guys were having Darnell as a third round, maybe even a second round. And I think honestly, because of his senior bowl performance is what vaulted him up into that first round conversation and second tackle off the board. Fascinating. So then we had Peter Skaronsky from Northwestern going to the Tennessee Titans. Interesting one. This one's fascinating for me. I loved Peter. I think he's the most technically sound offensive lineman in this past draft. You know, from a fundamental standpoint, I worry a little bit about his length, um, being able to play on the edge. He's not as big and long as some of these tackles, but I do think he could be a Quentin Nelson. He could be a Zach Martin that bumps inside and has a tremendous career. You know, I think that for me, if you take a guy in the first, you put him at tackle and let him fail before you just be like, oh, he can't play tackle. Right. Like put him out there, let him see, because there's a lot of guys. Deion Dawkins is a great example. Not the tallest guy in the world, not the longest guy in the world for the Buffalo Bills, but a Pro Bowl left tackle. You know, I I think that sometimes we can get a little too wrapped up in the length and a little too wrapped up in the arm length and all that stuff. I say let him go out the left tackle in training camp, OTA, see how he does. And if he's struggling out there, move him inside and he's going to be a starting guard, no question. But I think you got to give that guy a chance to play left tackle. Interesting perspective there because you're right. I mean, you talk to people around the league before the draft. They would all say two things, really good player, can't play tackle in the NFL. And I like your perspective on if he did it in college, give him a chance. The worst thing that can happen is you say, oh, okay, yeah, we'll kick him inside. But if you give him a chance and he succeeds, now you have one of your bookends for what, maybe a decade. Yep. So yeah, no, I really like that. Uh, Broderick Jones, the Pittsburgh Steelers trade up for Jones from Georgia. They needed a left tackle in the worst way. Um, You know, I think he's a guy that was extremely talented. I think he is not as athletic as Paris Johnson, um, but his run blocking is incredible. You know, you watch what that Georgia front did in all of college football last year. And honestly, thinking who he had to block all year round off of that Georgia defense, you know that he's a battle tested guy. Um, He's got really good balance as he's in his set. But what impressed me the most was his run ability as a left tackle. Very interesting. And then the Jacksonville Jaguars take Anton Harrison out of Oklahoma to wrap up the first round. Yeah, he's a guy that, um, honestly, I didn't have quite as high as I was watching him, but I think you just can't ignore his athletic ability and his size. Like you said, you can't coach the size of these guys that are taken. Like, And I think that what you saw with the departure of Orlando Brown, the departure of Andrew Wiley, and like we talked about earlier in the show, so much is dependent around that Patrick Mahomes contract you're not going to be able to go buy a starting left tackle in free agency because of the price tag of what those guys take. You have to draft and develop from within both of your tackles. You know, So I think that they drafted a guy that they see a lot of potential in, a guy that could come in and start right away for them, but knows that like you know he was down the list a little bit on the first rounders, but I think he's a guy that can start right away. And there might be a little growing pains, but I really liked his athletic profile as well. And just to dip into the second round, I mean, it, it would – it would probably be crazy of me not to ask you about the other center who was taken in the second round and who was going to play in New York and be compared to John Michael, and that is Joe Tittman from Wisconsin. I know I was one of several people who was surprised that he went there. What do you think the thinking is behind that? What, what kind of NFL player do you think he could be? Yeah, you know, everyone wanted to obviously compare John Michael and Joe Tittman because they were the top two centers in the class. But when you really got down to it, they're two completely different players, hmm. right? You have one, Joe Tittman is 6'6", 315 pounds. He's a tackle who's playing center who can run like a tackle, right? And then he's also only a three-year starter, you know? So you talk about he's young, he has the athletic profile that some teams want as center, or you have John Michael who's 6'4", 310, not going to blaze you with speed, but he's a road grader. His balance and pass protection has got a better anchor, in my opinion, than Joe. Um, and, you know, and so it's kind of for me, I knew it was going to come down to O-line coach fit. The O-line coach was going to pick which center he wanted. 
and you know is going to be what based off of the offense they run and based what they value in the middle as far as do we want a guy that can run and lanky and pull and get him out in space and do all those things that he's maybe a little better than John Michael or do we want a guy that's going to be able to sit down there not allow pocket pressure up the middle and really secure that pocket and then road grade and also is athletic enough to get out in space on screens, which he showed at the senior bowl. You know, so honestly, I may be a little biased, but I thought that John Michael should have been the first center taken off the board. Um, you know, but the jets obviously saw something in Tittman that, um, is going to allow them to think he's their starting center. And he has to now snap to Aaron Rodgers, which is going to be scary in of itself. <laughs> um, you know, but I think both those guys are going to have great careers. I think they're going to be, uh, the starting centers for both those teams for a long time because they honestly were, you could coin flip it really as far as who's going to be the best center in the draft. As you mentioned, how good of a pass protector and how good at setting John Michael is to protect that interior pocket. I am thinking of how much that could help Daniel Jones push the ball down the field, because obviously you want a center who can identify everything. You want to be able to run the ball, but the Giants were last in the league last year in 20-plus yard pass plays, and they draft Jalen Hyatt, who is a deep burner at wide receiver. They trade for Darren Waller, a tight end who can push the ball up the seam. And now, as you tell me that John Michael can set and really protect that interior pocket, maybe Brian Dable opens his offense up a little more because he feels like he has – the weapons and the skill sets at all of these different different positions to do that. That's really fascinating. I'm learning a lot from you today. I want to get you out of here on this. We've talked a lot about John Michael and things that he does well, but if if you had to tell Giants fans, you know, one or a couple of the primary reasons why this was a great pick and why he's going to succeed in New York, what do you think are the key traits that are going to lend to his early and consistent success as the Giants center? You know, the number one trait is he's a great kid. And, you know, he and I tell people this all the time, he playing in the NFL, not because he can, but because he wants to. And there's so many kids nowadays that I think are playing in the NFL because they have the God given ability and they can that you see those guys fizzle out. This guy loves ball. He eats it lunch and dinner. He just wants to be a ball player all the time. He texted me after day one of the draft and said, just get me a freaking helmet already. <laughs> right, like he was just ready to go, and so that's the number one thing that's going to have his success. Then, the, and the number two thing is, is he's just a fantastic player. You know, it's really hard to poke holes in his game. Yeah, it's easy to poke holes. Oh, he didn't run a five zero, or he didn't run a four nine. It's like, yeah, great, cool. Who cares? Did you see what he did to that nose guard? You know, like he's just a phenomenal player. And then the last thing is his leadership ability. You know, you can't play the center position in the NFL without being a tremendous leader. I think he's grown a ton in a leader in the last few years, and he's really just going to come in there and command that room. Love it. Jeremiah, this was a great time. Everybody, again, Brute O-Line on Instagram, at O-Line Committee on YouTube. Again, this is Talking Ball with Pat Leonard, brought to you by Bet Online. Jeremiah Searles, thank you so much for coming on, for lending your knowledge and expertise. We look forward to watching and working with John Michael Schmitz here in New York, and we will talk to you soon down the road. Absolutely appreciate you having me on.